starts right I'm telling you right now, now, we're dancing in the streets. Uh, thank goodness somebody stood up to protect the vulnerable people in our community. It's a celebration, but for how long? Today's court ruling coming from San Antonio's federal courthouse, allowing for eligible voters to request a mail-in ballot under the criteria for disability. The Bear County District Attorney says if you fear voting in person because of the coronavirus, feel free to apply to vote by mail. In his ruling today, U.S. District Judge Fred Beery says, quote, the court finds the Grim Reaper scepter of pandemic disease and death is far more serious than an unsupported fear of voter fraud. He went on to say, indeed, if you vote by if vote by mail fraud is real, logic dictates that all voting should be in person, end quote. But today's ruling doesn't mean the battle over ballots is over. Sure, there's always that po that uh, potential that uh, you uh, you request your ballot, you uh, you receive your ballot uh, and anything can happen from that point on. The legal battle is set to continue in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Attorney General Ken Paxton says his office will seek immediate review over today's ruling. Meanwhile, the Bear County runoff elections are scheduled for July. And of course, the general election is in November. Another major development, the stay home work safe order expected to be extended once again. The orders won't expire until June 4th if approved by city council on Thursday. The county has issued similar orders. Not much has really changed except a new date. Face coverings or masks are strongly encouraged for anyone 10 years of age or older. Employers are also encouraged to provide face coverings to employees who can't so social distance. The city is also encouraging small businesses to register for a free supply kit on the city's website. The mayor has said businesses can require customers to wear masks before entering. You are also encouraged to stay home as much as possible and minimize in-person contact with those outside your immediate household. As of today, the state Supreme Court is allowing eviction proceedings to resume, but there's no need to panic just yet. Under the CARES Act, there is still a moratorium on eviction filings until July 24th. That applies to complexes and units which are covered by that act. These are the residences which receive some form of funding from the federal government. And according to Judge Nelson Wolf, that's about 80% of the county. During tonight's daily briefing, Wolf also mentioned court proceedings for evictions aren't slated to resume until June 1st. And he's encouraging judges to work with landlords and renters to work out some kind of deal or payment plan in the meantime. A reminder, the city and the county have programs to help with housing during this pandemic, each using federal dollars. The application for the city program can be found online at sanantonio.gov. It helps with rent, mortgage and utilities. The city approved $25 million for that program. They've already had more than 7,000 applications for more than half the money. The city is expecting up to 10,000 applications this week. Daycares are gearing up to reopen, but there's a hitch with the new guidelines that might mean not all families will get a spot. The night team's Patty Santos tells us daycare operators were caught off guard with the immediate reopening of daycares. When the governor announced yesterday open immediately, my phone started ringing like my parents were already like, hey, the governor just announced we could come back. Daycare owner Stephanie Gray says that sudden announcement is making it difficult for facilities like hers. The ratios, that just made my heart drop because I know I have parents waiting to come back. A strict 13 page guideline details new requirements on how many kids per caregiver and how much space is expected for children and with more than 40 kids on her waiting list. I'm going to have to make the call and say, hey, no, you've been worried, waiting for a month and a half. But guess what? I, I don't have no room for you. And because of the 10 to 1 ratio changes, she's going to have to hire one more staff member while she's also losing 15 kids. Because this is new for everybody. The new ratio guidelines have parents like Lauren Pepping on hold again, waiting to see if their kid will make the cut for summer daycare program. With the new changes in the ratios, we base, they basically had to scrap that and change everything and re-enroll. And people and grandparents she's used to relying on are considered high risk age. We're all struggling to find the right answer and solution. Finding food and cleaning supplies will be another struggle as well as they reopen. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. 
Let's take a look at the latest numbers of COVID-19 in our community tonight. There are more than 2,200 cases in Bear County. The death toll remains the same at 62, but the number of people in the hospital has now risen to 80. More than 1,100 people have recovered from the disease. 1,084 people are still fighting COVID-19. Jobs have taken a big hit amid the pandemic, especially in the travel industry, and there's a ripple effect. Less flights mean less money coming in from tourism and hotels. Our Tiffany Huerta speaks with members of the travel and tourism industry about what they're experiencing. The deals are excellent. Patricia Stout, president of the Alamo Travel Group, says while there are great travel deals, business is down. The calls are about 20 per day. I mean, we used to have about 600 calls a day. Patricia says sales are down 75% for almost 40 years. The Alamo Travel Group has been offering different services in San Antonio. Airline tickets, we offer car rentals, hotel reservations, motels anywhere in the world, tours. But Stout says they've never seen anything like this. The customer is saying bluntly, I'm not going to travel. The U.S. Travel Association says travel to and within the U.S. came to a standstill in March, impacting travel businesses and workers. 38% of all the unemployed in the United States are from the travel industry. This is two times worse than the Great Depression was in the worst year for the travel industry. President and CEO of the U.S. Travel Association, Roger Dow, says he estimates it will take six months for the industry to get back on its feet. First is going to come local travel. Uh, people are saying they're going to drive. Then meetings and conventions will come back. And finally, international. Here at home, visit San Antonio. The public-private partnership that promotes tourism and conventions in our city says more than 50 conventions and meetings they were involved with have been canceled. They are expecting to see a 30 to 40 percent loss on this year's hotel occupancy tax, an impact of 7.5 to 10 million dollars. As Texas continues to reopen, eyes remain on the travel and tourism industry. We're watching Texas very carefully. We're going to learn from Texas. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. And while limited businesses happening, COVID-19 continues to keep a lot of people out of work. There are discussions to change that, hopefully through job training. County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez says there's also talks of a stipend involved to help participants pay bills and put food on the table while they're being trained. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says the program would use federal funds again through the CARES Act. We have appropriated the money for it, as Justin said, and we hope to reach 5,000 people. And we're going to be concentrating on trying to reach those that are in the service industry. Uh, that got hit the hardest and the lowest wage people. So this is an opportunity for them to really get a skill and make more money than they were making before. The mayor, Ron Nuremberg, says the city is going to have a work session tomorrow on this very topic. He also says he wants to continue to remain coordinated with whatever the county does. A father and son killed in a motorcycle crash overnight, now identified. 36-year-old Reinerio Lopez and his son, 15-year-old Franklin, were on the motorcycle before it slammed into a wall. It happened around midnight on General Hudnell near Couples Road. Investigators believe Lopez lost control on a curve before crashing. Both father and son died at the scene. A church targeted and now a suspect in the case. It's an update to a story we first brought you last week on the Night Beat. Take a good look here. Do you recognize this man? He was captured on surveillance video and now police believe he's connected to a burglary at St. Paul Catholic Church over on the west side. A computer and about $3,000 worth of band instruments were stolen from the church's community center. Someone broke through a side door and left with that equipment. If you recognize the man police are looking for, call West Property Crimes Detective Alvarez at the number on your screen. That's 210-207-4109. He's no Superman, I can tell you that. Yeah. All right, still ahead, hundreds of foster teens graduating from high schools across Texas this year. Tonight, the effort to adopt a senior coming up. And the president has decided to take hydroxychloroquine amid this pandemic. But is it a good idea? How Dr. Ruth Berggren is responding tonight in our coronavirus Q&A. Plus, a problem, that property, a problem property sparks up concerns. The arrests made at a local mobile home park where numerous fires have taken place. It's next on the Night Beat. 
want to tell you about some breaking news just into our newsroom right now. The San Marcos Police Department evacuating their building, their headquarters on I-35 right now over concerns of a gas leak. Officers say that a vehicle hit a gas main in that area. Right now, 911 calls are being transferred to Hayes County dispatchers. Of course, we'll bring you any updates as they become available. It's been the site of several fires igniting suspicions of arson. Investigators were back out at the Jasper Mobile Home Park this afternoon. The property on Walsham Road gaining so much attention, the Bear County Sheriff's Office started a joint operation with multiple agencies in January of last year. Just last week, flames tore through an abandoned home, mobile home there. Today, Bear County deputies were on the property to serve felony arrest warrants and look for more code violations. As a result of those arsons, there was some some uh, uh, interference with uh, with witnesses on the part of some of the employees of this uh, this facility uh, that they were quite frankly trying to trying to intimidate some of the witnesses to uh, to those arsons. At least two people were taken into custody. More arrests are expected though. The Bear County Fire Marshal's office also says they found 55 vacant and unsecured structures that were described as fire hazards here. Also new tonight, a family opened the door to flames inside their converted garage. It happened at a home on Near Avenue, not too far from almost elementary school. The cause of the fire is still under investigation, but firefighters say a plastic gas can caught fire in that garage, which intensified the flames. The flames were contained to the garage and everyone was able to make it out safely, including the family's pets. One event, two chances to do some good. The Double Down Blood Drive kicks off on Thursday. Not only will it help give the gift of life for every blood donation made at the event, $5 will be donated to the San Antonio Food Bank, courtesy of, a silver, of the Silverado Event Center. The blood drive will run Thursday through Saturday at the Alamo Dome. There'll be plenty of space to keep everyone at a safe distance, but you must make an appointment to donate. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center making it easy by offering a way to make an appointment online. Just go to southtexasblood.org. Those who do donate blood can also receive an HEB gift card. Only 45% of foster children graduate high school or get a GED. That's why it's important to acknowledge the 500 foster kids across Texas who are graduating this year. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it difficult for those students to be celebrated. So during National Foster Care Month, two driven teenagers are asking for the community's help. The night team's Courtney Friedman with the story. Many Texans know 18-year-old Allie Graves as Miss Texas Outstanding Teen, but few know her story of neglect and abuse beginning at birth. I was neglected on a daily basis. A family member walked in and saw me being abused and immediately called any authority. At six years old, she was adopted into a loving family. Her advocacy for foster kids led her to Hunter Beaton, a Bernie teen who we featured on KSAT for his work donating over 30,000 bags and backpacks to foster youth. Three out of Beaton's four siblings are adopted foster children. They often are given a trash bag to place their clothes in or whatever items that they have in their possession. Almost 500 foster teens are graduating from high schools across Texas this year, and Beaton and Graves don't want COVID-19 to stop those grads from getting love and support. They're asking their communities to virtually adopt a 2020 senior from foster care by donating money. And that's a beautiful phrase, especially for these foster youth, because many times these foster youth are looking simply for adoption. Beaton and Graves will give at least $100 in gift cards and a free bag to every one of those 500 foster grads. I just want these kids to know they're not defined by their circumstances and that they're loved by their communities. It's easy to donate. All you have to do is go to this Facebook page, adopt a 2020 senior from foster care. There's a blue sign up button at the top. You click it, fill out how much you want to donate. The deadline to donate is June 1st. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. What a great idea. Yes, Yeah. indeed. I, th I just think of all those seniors yeah. that are going to remember this graduation mm -hmm. year for the graduation ceremony that didn't happen. Didn't happen, yeah. yeah. All right, 84 degrees out there, very warm day today, Adam. Yeah, the heat high, it was in control of our weather today, but it's not going to really maintain that control for the rest of the week. But looking at our high temperatures today, we were feeling it, 96 here in San Antonio. Del Rio topped out at 108. That was a record by four degrees. Carrizo Springs and Catula both at 104 earlier today. Now, in terms of temperatures as we go forward, 
we're still going to see some warmth out there and some heat the next couple of days. I mean, 94 tomorrow, then down to 90 Thursday and Friday. But notice we dipped at, back down into the 80s for highs by this weekend. With that drop in temperatures, I think we'll be a little uptick in our rain chances. At least they'll be back in the picture for an extended stretch of time. Okay, first let's talk about temperatures. And right now we're mostly in the 70s and 80s. Bernie Stage Airfield 77, Bulverde's 85, 88 Port SA, Rio Medina 79. So a bit of a variety out there in terms of the readings, especially when you head west of town. Del Rio's 93 and Carrizo Springs at 90. Not only hot today, but we also had the humidity as well. And we still have that mugginess, especially locations around I-35 and eastward. Not all that humid along the border right now, but your humidity, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Kamado, it's going to be increasing. Look how thick it is closer to the Gulf of Mexico. It's that time of year. Water's at about 80 degrees, so dew points with that wind coming off the water. Upper 70s, Gonzales, Beeville, even Corpus Christi at 77. Humidity's not going anywhere anytime soon. We just have to get used to it. It's sticky out there, and that's what we get in May here in San Antonio. And June, July, and August, and September. Sometimes October we get a little bit of it. As, actually, we do in October as well. Anyway, taking a look at the satellite and radar. A lot of activity out there in West Texas earlier today. Nothing strong, nothing severe, just their typical uh, terrain circulations that develop particularly uh, farther to the west, uh, Big Bend area. And I think that's going to happen again tomorrow. But the difference is, and really the next several evenings, but the difference is we could get some of the leftovers the next few nights. So here's the overall pattern. A lot of activity along the east coast and eastern third of the nation, west coast, big upper level low as well. So a lot of activity out there, but we're wedged in the middle where there's, where there's this big ridge, big bump in the upper level flow. That's the heat high that's in effect, but it's going to be breaking down. Notice how it moves southward. It's not as amplified. And for the rest of the week, we're going to see that big blue H get pushed southward. And we're not going to have a huge disturbance move in anytime soon, but the door is going to be open for these ripples and these dips in the upper level flow to move overhead. All it takes is a little instability combined with those. Boom, you have a few thunderstorms. Our first chance is tomorrow night. So we'll start the day tomorrow. Here you go, 7 a.m., low clouds. The typical low gray clouds in the morning. They'll burn off by about 10, 11. And then a lot of sunshine into the afternoon. But into the afternoon, we'll likely have storms flaring up in Mexico and West Texas. And we'll just have to keep a close eye on that activity as it moves eastward we could get the leftovers of it. Not expecting anything strong or severe, but if we're lucky tomorrow night, we could cash in on some of the leftover showers, maybe a clap of thunder from it, and that would be it. Sure, odds are slim, but at least it's a chance. And then as we get into the weekend, some higher chances. So tomorrow, 73 in the morning, 80 at noon, 94 for the high temperature southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. And then we'll have the chance of daily pop-up afternoon storms, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and even that off chance of some West Texas leftovers every night there. But as we get into Sunday and Memorial Day, that's when we've got those chances now up a little bit higher, scattered category, 40%. And if everything stays on track, we may even be increasing those numbers even more in the days ahead. So that's one of the features we're watching closely and we'll keep you updated on. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, you can tell a guy who's very eager to get back to work. He's the first one in the office when they open. And that would be the owner, the president, <laughs> yeah. and the general manager, Jerry Jones, knocking people down to get back to the start of day. When we come back, we'll let you know why Jerry is back in the office today, of all days, and how close will LeBron James get to becoming a Dallas Cowboy coming up. This is a big day for our clubs. I think it's a big day for the NFL. I think it's a big day for sports. Uh, it's a big day for building confidence. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, one of the first to enter the Cowboys facility today when the NFL allowed teams to reopen their headquarters for the first time during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Cowboys owner, president, and general manager hit the ground running today, reporting to the start 7.30 this morning, the first time the league has allowed staff and some players back to their facility since the coronavirus broke out. No players or coaches just yet, just some staff and players who are undergoing rehabilitation from previous injuries are allowed back into the facilities at this time. Joining the Cowboys in the first day of opening facilities are the Texans, Falcons, Cardinals, and Colts with the Jaguars set for next Tuesday. 
there was no better place uh, than right here in our office, my office, to uh, participate uh, in the virtual league meeting that we're having. Uh, in the days and weeks ahead, I look forward to welcoming many of our employees uh, back to our workplace. Uh, we're committed to doing uh, what is safe and smart and everything that complies with uh, all the rules. All right, good to hear. LeBron James playing for the Dallas Cowboys. The NBA superstar has admitted that he seriously considered playing professional football during the NBA lockout in 2011. The revelation was made during the podcast on Uninterrupted with Paul Rivera and Maverick Carter. You can see LeBron was an all-state receiver in his sophomore and junior season in high school, and many, including now Clippers head coach Doc Rivers, believe he had the talent to play professional football, and James even changed his workouts to get into football shape. We started to clock our times with the 40s. We started to add a little bit more in our bench presses and things of that nature. We started to add more sled into our to our agenda with our with our uh, workouts. And um, you know, Mike kept talking about you know it'd be great to go down to Irvine, Texas. Did you get the call from Bron saying, "Hey, I might want to do this"? <laughs> I did not, but I know he got a contract from Jerry Jones uh, that he framed and put in his office. Unfortunately, the podcast moved to another subject before any amount of the contract was revealed. But at six foot eight and 250 pounds, James would have been a very imposing player in the NFL. And as it turns out, the lockout ended in December that year, and LeBron would go on to win the MVP as well as the NBA championship and the NBA Finals MVP, beating Oklahoma City in five games with the Heat. The NBA draft lottery was supposed to take place tonight, but like everything else in the NBA, that is now on hold with no definite new date in sight. And as it appears impossible at this point to finish the entire 82 game schedule due to the suspension of play due to the COVID-19 pandemic, team executives still expect the same exact format to take place when the lottery is held. If that's the case and no other regular season games are held, then right now the teams with the best shot at the number one pick in the NBA draft are the Golden State Warriors, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Minnesota Timberwolves, all with the three worst records. The Warriors, Cavs, and Wolves would have a 14% chance at landing the number one pick with Atlanta and Detroit to follow at 12.5 and 10.5% respectively. Here's a look at the rankings. We'll start at the top 10 here. Golden State, Cleveland, Minnesota, Atlanta, and Detroit in the top five. The second half of the top 10 looks like this with New York, Chicago, Charlotte, Washington, Phoenix, and San Antonio checks in with a 2% chance if the season ended right now. Former UTSA, Trinity, and UIW head coach Ken Burmeister has passed away due to cancer. A college basketball coach for 21 years, Ken took the Roadrunners to their first ever appearance in the NCAA tournament in 1988, where they lost to Illinois. After taking over at Loyola in 1994, he went on to coach at Trinity University for one season for taking over the Cardinals for 12 years. Ken Burmeister leaves us at the age of 72. The subject of the Spurs' last championship in 2014 when they were able to rally back from losing to the Miami Heat in seven games in 2013 after that gut-wrenching last-second comeback in Game 6 spurred on by Ray Allen's three-pointer came up in the finale of Coffee Gang. That's where Patty Mills, Manu Ginobili, Boris Dion, Tiago Splitter carry on the tradition started by Spurs head coach Greg Popovich taking the team to dinner after games. Often the players would get together for coffee to continue their camaraderie that was generated by the meetings, but now instead of getting together in San Antonio or on the road, it's with virtual meetings and today Today's final question was asked by Patty. Favorite, favorite 2014 memory. This can be our, our last answer that we can all give as a tribute to, to the fans. How we enjoyed the successes of our teammates. I'm not gonna lie, I got a little bit teary-eyed watching uh, that video. We knew we were getting close to win NBA title. For me, it was my uh, my only uh, my only title. Yeah, that picture. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, so that was that was super super cool time. I like the way Manu had the photo ready to go. Awesome. Hey, remember this? I yeah. still have it. Boris <laughs> Diaw has a mohawk. Yes, he does. That's what I took out of coffee time. <laughs> Catching up. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. It's still ahead. We're going to check in with Dr. Ruth Bergeron in the latest edition of Coronavirus Q and A. What she says about hydroxychloroquine. Next on the night. With the easing of restrictions this week, the urgency for a vaccine is growing. And now the possibility that there could be one, one less thing to fear, getting the coronavirus twice. The president tonight continuing to defend his surprising decision to take that unproven drug hydroxychloroquine. ABC's Ramita Puga has more. 
On Capitol Hill Tuesday, President Trump refusing to back down on his decision to take that controversial anti-malaria drug. It gives you an additional level of safety, but you can ask many doctors are in favor of it. The FDA explicitly warning against the use of hydroxychloroquine for COVID treatment outside of hospitals or clinical trials. And physicians warn of dangerous side effects. There is a potential for cardiac abnormalities, abnormal heart rhythm, uh, eye issues, retinopathy, and those are all possible with its use. But the president's own doctor saying after numerous discussions, we concluded the potential benefit from the treatment outweighed the relative risks. This week, every state in the country easing restrictions. Georgia, one of the first to reopen, faced intense criticism, including from the president. I think it's too soon. But now, three weeks in, no major statewide spike. ABC News also looking at 21 states that have eased restrictions and have found no major change in hospitalizations or deaths. And an encouraging turn after 277 recovered South Korean COVID-19 patients tested positive a second time. Once you get infected with COVID-19, it's unlikely that you're going to get infected again. The South Korean CDC thinks it's likely those relapse cases were actually due to testing failures, calling the test results false positives and saying the traces of the virus detected were actually harmless dead samples. Meantime, the race for a vaccine is on. Pharmaceutical giant Pfizer has phase one and two trials underway simultaneously. And a manufacturing plant in Michigan is ramping up before even having the vaccine. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. It's the time of the show where we try to separate the fear from the facts out there. What is really happening when it comes to coronavirus and COVID-19? And there are a lot of things happening right now, including the reopening of the state of Texas. We are joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio and infectious disease doctors. We always are on Tuesday. Doctor, thank you for being with us. And to be here. when we're talking about the reopening of the state, the first question we have tonight is, are you concerned about the state's hospitalization rate, which is something we talked about a little bit at six? Yeah, you know, so everybody's guidelines um, all point to the fact that when you ease restrictions, you want to be confident that there's been a sustained and very real decline in cases. And an important indicator of how many cases you have is how many people are in the hospital. Um, we can get confused when we just look at the actual positivity rate because that'll change as we target different populations. If we go and test all the nursing home residents, if we test all the people in the jail, we're bound to find more cases and more positives and we expect to see some of those spikes and we've seen them here in San Antonio. Um, but not all those people are going to get sick. And um, anybody who's in the community who has virus and is getting sick with it and, and getting very sick is going to eventually land in the hospital. And that hospitalization rate is not going to be affected by targeted testing or ramping up testing. It's a real rate. And that hasn't really changed, Steve. In the last month, it's been very flat to maybe a slight uptick if you compare mid-April to late May. And that's data that is available for anybody to find um, on you know, it's publicly available data about hospitalizations in the state of Texas. So I'm concerned. Yeah, that's clearly something you'd like to see on the on the way down, like the curve change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The next question. Now that testing has been expanded to include people without symptoms, who should get tested? This seems to be a very popular question. Uh, who should get tested and why you should get tested? Right. So we're recommending that uh, people who are at risk for bad outcomes and those who are around them or who care for them should be the ones that get tested. And so we always start with older folks, anybody over the age of 64, or the people who live with those folks or who care for them. And then the other people who are at risk for bad outcomes are folks with poor health with respect to their hearts, their lungs. Um, their kidneys, people with chronic diabetes, people who are immunocompromised for a variety of reasons. Those are the folks that we want to protect and we should strategically have our tests done in a way that protects the people that have those problems. Healthcare workers uh, should be tested, the people who go into nursing homes should be tested, and in fact, we've been working hard to get all the detention deputies at the jail tested as well. All right, the president, next question is about the president. The president says he takes hydroxychloroquine. Is this a good idea in your opinion? 
Uh, what the president is doing is taking a medication that uh, for an indication that we have no idea if it if it works for that or not. Hydroxychloroquine is a drug that I'm very familiar with. It has another name, Plaquenil. It's used to treat lupus and it's used to treat malaria, um, especially in places where there's still chloroquine sensitive malaria. And it is a drug that has many uses and it's a good drug. It does have its side effects though. So we only use prescription medication when we know that the benefits are gonna outweigh the risks. And the public needs to know the risks of hydroxychloroquine are not trivial. And they start with effects on the heart. So it can interfere with the electrical conduction system of your heart, which is how the rhythm of your heart is generated. And some people could get very dangerous heart arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms, which could even get serious enough for somebody to have a sudden cardiac death. Um, the drug is toxic to the heart muscle itself. It also has myriad other side effects in certain people. Some people will have suppression of their bone marrow so they can wind up with more immunocompromised state because their, their own bone marrow is not making the cells that it needs to make. There's toxicity to the eye. Long-term use of hydroxychloroquine can cause macular degeneration and retinal toxicity. So it's really no joke. It's a good drug when it's indicated and when the benefits are gonna outweigh the risk. We have no good evidence that it does anything at all in COVID-19. In fact, there's a very real study that's very concerning that was done in our own veteran population uh, with credible investigators from um, Virginia and South Carolina. And what they found is when hydroxychloroquine was used in veterans with COVID-19, they actually had a higher rate of death, mm. a higher rate of death, and no improvement in whether or not they would need a ventilator compared to people who weren't getting hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. That study has limitations, okay? It wasn't a huge study and it's retrospective. It's not a double-blind, randomized, prospective, controlled trial. But those kind of trials are actually being done. So uh, the National Institute of Health is sponsoring a number of those. One just got started recently in San Diego. Um, they're using the umbrella of the AIDS clinical trial researchers to study 2,000 people prospectively that, are gonna, that have COVID-19, people that aren't sick enough to be in the hospital, but that, have, that are sick, and they're either going to get hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, which is another antibiotic, or they're gonna get two placebo pills. And they're gonna monitor those folks going forward to see if this combination could possibly prevent hospitalization or death. So that just got started. There's uh, another trial that's going on with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and more that I'm not even able to rattle off. So we are going to get data. And I imagine it's going to be a matter of weeks and maybe months, but we'll have real solid information. Until that happens, I do not recommend that people take this drug. All right, a lot of things reopening. One of them, restaurants, bars. If a waiter speaks without a mask, will they infect my food? That's a viewer question tonight. So um, I am of the opinion that waiters should be masked to the extent possible. Uh, the purpose of wearing a mask is to protect other people from getting the virus if you have it and you don't realize that you have it. First of all, the waiter shouldn't be at work if the waiter is sick, right? But the waiter should wear a mask because he or she might be sick and not realize it yet. Is it going to get on your food and then you'll get it from your food? There's no evidence that eating food is the way that the virus gets to you. It's much more likely that a respiratory droplet is generated as the person is speaking, multiple little droplets kind of spew out from a person who's speaking. The louder they speak, the more droplets there are, and those land on your face, or you breathe them in, or they land on a surface that you then touch, and then you touch your eye or your mouth, and that's how you get it. There's been no evidence at all of transfer from a person to food and then to a person. Right, all right, final question tonight. When will we know if we reopen things too soon? 
Yes, so there's a number of warning indicators. It's, uh, the warning indicators are a decrease in the time to the doubling of cases, um, an increase in the stress of the hospital, so more occupancy of hospital beds, ICU beds, and ventilators um, with lack of sufficient protective personal equipment or PPE. And then the other warning indicator that's important is to look at the percentage of the cases in a community that are positive. And right now we have seen a low percentage and a declining percentage. I think the last time I saw it, it was around 3.6% of the people in San Antonio who go to get tested for whatever reason are positive. Compare that to hot spots. There's a hot spot in Amarillo right now where the percent positive is about 10 times what we have in San Antonio. Right, so right. we want to be watching for those rises before they get out of control. And that would tell us we need to retreat back to more stringent restrictions as we had in the early days. On a time frame wise, or do you think when we could first possibly see that? I think is, as a layman is guessing, still we're like a week or two at least away from seeing those kind of indications. Yes, I think you're right about that. Um, also, I think that uh, not everybody in San Antonio is rushing out to ease those restrictions. I, I, and it's mixed, right? Some people haven't been taking it too seriously, but the majority have. Most people I talk to, Steve, are really very, very concerned. Um, even the restaurant owners, the folks who really want to get back into business. So I, I, I see in our community a rather slow easing of the restrictions, and I think it's going to be at least another week to two weeks before we see some of these indicators uh, showing us worsening numbers. Great information. Dr. Ruth Bergren, UT Health San Antonio. Thank you so much for your time, doctor. Happy to be here. Thank you. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather streaming free on KSAT TV. Bridging the digital divide. That's the mission of Goodwill San Antonio's Electronics and Technology Access Program, which has been helping people getting connect, get connected long before the coronavirus pandemic. However, the pandemic quickly accelerated demand and Goodwill has risen to meet that challenge. Through their partnership with Restore Education, Good, Goodwill has been able to provide dozens of refurbished laptops to students in need. Many of those students come from low or no income families or our first generation college students. One of the classes I went to and actually helped distribute laptops to uh, the people there were so grateful because they could get online and talk to their family or, or, or those things that we take for granted, right? Um, it was, it was, uh, it's quite meaningful to be able to provide devices to people who don't have them and connect them in a way they're not currently connected. And it's not just students. For those who need them, Goodwill has been able to continue providing other individuals as well as businesses with computers. They're able to do so through donations of old PCs and laptops. And there's, though there's no shortage of parts, Goodwill says electronic donations are always welcome. Live look outside right now, 84 degrees. And, uh, you know, I guess we escaped today yeah could have been could have been could hotter have could have been hotter 96 is what we made it to and we could have been in the upper 90s close to 98 99 but the humidity stuck around and that made it harder for that temperature to rise up the trade-off is that the heat index was higher so it felt like it was 101 102 anyway the aquifer good news here it's up three tenths of a foot again today we're at 665.4 so we're still above that critical number of 660 so we've been able to stave off the water restrictions, at least for now. Mold, though, is high at nearly 1,700. All righty, let's talk about what's happening out there with a look at our lake levels, because we did have some recent rainfall, and so every once in a while we like to check in with our lakes, and it really didn't cause much of a change, I'll be honest with you. Medina actually down a little bit more, 68% uh, full, so 15 feet below the conservation pool. Canyon at 96%, and that's two feet low. Uh, Amistad at 44 feet below the conservation pool. High temperatures today across the state. Well, okay, San Angelo, that's an error right there. They actually broke a record earlier today. Anyway, Del Rio did break a record at 108 with four degrees to spare. So they've 
broke that record uh, pretty pretty handily. 83 in Hondo, 77 now in Fredericksburg, 93 still in Del Rio. Air is a little bit drier off to the west. That's why their temperatures boosted up. Interesting. Anyway, these are our afternoon temperatures. It's a new background for us. All right. Let's go with it. 94 tomorrow. Notice how we stair step our way down. We're near 90 Thursday and Friday and then into the 80s as we go into the upcoming weekend. Afternoon temperatures go down. Rain chances come back in the picture. Now, with the exception of tonight, every night this week, we could run into the leftovers of a few West Texas storms. The, you know, those isolated to widely separated showers and a few claps of thunder at night. That could happen pretty much any night going forward here, but also in the afternoon hours, these little pop up isolated showers and storms are possible as well with right now. It looks like just a slightly greater chance Sunday and Monday in terms of showers and storms, but we may have to raise those chances a bit as we get more information. So something to keep in mind. I know it's not an ideal timing with Memorial Day weekend and Memorial Day around here. Kind of infam infamous for storms, right? Uh, doesn't mean it's going to happen, but we may be increasing those chances here as we get more info. 72 in the morning, 94 tomorrow afternoon, low morning clouds, then a lot of afternoon sun. There's that 30% chance pretty much every afternoon all the way through the rest of the week. And then we bump up the chances a little bit more by Sunday and Monday temperatures, though. It's not going to be overly hot this upcoming weekend and we'll have highs in the 80s. Thank you, Adam. The barbecue business big in Texas up next. A look at how the pandemic is leading to problems with beef prices. Barbecue is big in Texas, and because of a kink in the meat supply chain, prices are ballooning. Yeah, it's an added strain on restaurants, and as Marilyn Moritz reports, that means you may be paying a little more as well. Lunch hour at the barbecue station. How about pickles and onions and bread? And customers are grabbing takeout. But make no mistake, the pandemic has butchered the barbecue business. Customer spending is down, while costs are beefed up. Everything's gone up a little bit, but brisket's been the is outrageous and brisket's half the meat we sell. Two weeks ago, owner Stuart Peacock paid three sixty for a pound of prime brisket. Last week, six twenty nine. What a lot of people don't understand is if you pay six twenty nine a pound for brisket, by the time you trim it, smoke it, now your yield is half. At the Big Bib barbecue, they've seen brisket cost double two. I've never seen it this high. And I'm the one that does the order, and I've never seen it this high. Pitmaster Tamu Gonzalez says they just paid eight bucks a pound for Prime. Some businesses say they have to pass along some of their increased costs. For some, that means adding on up charges. For others, it's just raising menu prices. We just went up just a little bit on our brisket price, not a lot, because we also understand that we still have to be mindful to the customers. Just last week, Peacock raised his price of brisket from 16 to $21 a pound, the first price increase in years. Now a necessity for a growing number of restaurants because beef prices are eating their lunch. I've heard of places around the state maybe taking brisket off the menu, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we can do that. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Coming up still ahead, the Obama is set to wrap up an online series next week. The performance you won't want to miss. Coming up. The city of San Antonio has free supplies for nonprofits and small businesses. Thermometers, hand sanitizer, and face masks are all part of the kits city officials plan to hand out next week. Qualifying businesses and organizations can register online or by calling 311. We have all the details on KSAT.com. It's just one of the many articles our web team has put together as we make our way through the pandemic. Again, that's KSAT.com. All right, some penguins from the Kansas City Zoo took a little trip to the Nelson Atkins Museum oh, earlier so this cute. month. The museum's closed to human visitors due to coronavirus restrictions. They were happy to host these special guests. The executive director said the penguins seem to react much better to the Caravaggio than the Monet. <laughs> the trio of Peruvian penguins 
reportedly very well behaved during their visit. They and, are just so you know, cute. Yeah, they were dressed for the occasion. Yes, that's indeed. for sure. Yeah. Well, the Obamas are keeping kids entertained while they're at home. President Barack Obama joined his wife, Michelle, for the latest in her series of online video readings. Mondays with Michelle Obama is part of the PBS Kids Read Along series, which the former first lady started on April 20th. The series ends next Monday when pet dogs so Sonny and Mono will keep her company as she reads, Can I Be Your Dog? I heard the former president actually had to make, make like sound effects. Oh, really? <laughs> during that reading. Now, yeah, now I've got to watch. i got to yeah, hook my know, kids up with so. that. Yeah. They'd like it. All right, so tomorrow we'll have a lot of sunshine, 72 in the morning, making it into the mid-90s by the afternoon, about 94 the high temperature. And then we'll see temperatures gradually fall off a little bit as rain chances come back into the picture. So some daily, daily chances here and there. I can just see Michelle Obama asking the president, do this please. It's like, <laughs> no, no, but then he's, you know, when your yes. wife really wants you